presenting Dr. Kiran Bedi. That's a tall one, isn't it? You're going to be having leadership, you're going to have women, and you'll have social work. Now, I finish at what time? <laughs> it's 10 to 1. What time do you want your lunch? How soon? 1 o'clock? 1 o'clock. So, 1.30. First of all, let me begin by saying who, who responsible for bringing me here and to say thank you to Vishal Kothari. Can you stand up to say uh, and acknowledge my gratitude, Vishal Kothari? <laughs> Ahuj, Anuj, Anuj Sabuta, Griva, hi Griva. Anushka Babar, Babar, there she is. Okay, then let me know I met you. <laughs> Let them know I thank you. Hi. <laughs> Support manager, Sahil Bahar. Is that there? Are they there? Yeah, oh. Professor Abhinay Mathu. He's hosting for us. Oh. <laughs> it's a, almost a continuity. My, my sharing with you is almost a continuity of what Mrs. Rajni Manian said. So, we welcome Shashi Tharu Ramaskas. <laughs> Shashi and I worked together a little bit in the, at the United Nations. In fact, he's responsible for my going there too. So here is my sharing on these three in these three areas, particularly after the last one month, what I have uh, dared to do and come out of it uh, not drowned. Um, my presentation on leadership has evolved. It's considerably changed. What I used to say earlier, I am going to say it a little differently, a little more. So it's coming out of a lot of great experience in, in just about last four weeks' time, and I'm sure when you were following the news, you, were, you must have known it. So the, here it is, not from a textbook, but from my years of life. So it's totally learning on my feet. I begin with my, my first slide is that before we are a leader, as I was mentioning, this slide is about leadership, women, and social work. And my presentation is going to be linked, is focused on all three areas. And the slides, in fact, these slides were made just 48 hours before I, just, why I knew I'm going to make it here. So it's coming straight from the heart. Now, when I thought of leadership for you, as you as youngsters, that's the first thought which came to my mind is that each of us, before we think we are a leader, we emerge as a leader, we are a person first. When I say that, I want you to look at yourself and reflect a little. That before, for leadership is a, considered as a position. It's like physically as a position, right at the top, the head of a department, or a, or a, or a Shashi Taru is a member of parliament, or a minister, or somebody uh, who's an academic vice chancellor. So you look at as a, or a father at home, is a leader of the, it's like a leader or mother, leader of the family or head of the family. So first of all, before each of us look at ourselves as a leader, I would say we are a person first. And that's a thought I wanted to leave you with. Is This is very vital for me, that before whoever we are, we are holistically a person. And what is a person? The person is the body, it is the mind, and it is also mind over the mind. When I say the body, that's a vehicle, that's an instrument through which we deliver. And it has a mind which uses this body. But there's a mind over a mind. If you've got this thought before, I'll be very happy to know. But this is a thought which I have acquired. Because there is a thought over a thought. 
There is only at one time one thought which stays with you. There are no two thoughts. One thought supersedes the other. And the supersession again replaces one. There's a constant thinking, but what stays in your mind is one thought. So there is a thought over a thought, or there's a mind over a mind. Some people even call it the soul. So it could be the body, the body which we use as an instrument, a mind which is a part of the body, which uses the mind to deliver, but then there's a mind over a mind which is constantly thinking, which we probably could even call it the soul. It varies from our culture to culture. So from the person is, is, is three of us, three persons, uh, three segments of ourselves. So what is leadership therefore? Leadership is a person with a bunch of very heavy skill sets. What are those skill sets I'm going to come to? I'm going to leave considerable time for question answers. So therefore, therefore I said it's a continuity of my last and a very well explained particularly set of communications. So therefore leadership, my friends, is a person with a very big bunch of skill sets. So remains a person, but it's plus skill sets. What are those skill sets? Let's look at them. Skill sets are our strengths and there are weaknesses. I want you to look at what are those possible strengths and weaknesses. You can list out many. The A could be, now I said rate, rating ourselves. It could be a little self-audit which I always believed in. That very important vital aspect of leadership is constant self-audit. So the, what could be the skill sets of a bunch of sets? It could be personal skills. It could be professional skills. It could be the value systems. It could be the learned skills which we are learning at our, at our workplaces or our academic places. So you have two, 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 so you have two levels. These could be value systems, and I urge you to have a look at it at an early, early on in life. It helps, and rate yourself for personal and professional, and then see what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses, and that's called the skill sets coming from a person. Now, it, the personal skill could, could be integrity, could be courage, could be endurance, could be patience, could be punctuality could be compassion, could be helping others, could be being respectful. You can have a list of these. Similarly, in the professional skills, I'm coming to those. So it's very important early on in life, in, in leadership, as I explain to you the next one, why I'm saying this, is important that I'm building over towards something of a skill set. So these are two very, th very important things, is these are learned by yourself. Personal value systems is by and large learned by ourselves through various means, but the effort is more, and we are probably, it's life which examines us. Life's challenges which examines us. It, it, it unravels us. It tells us who we are. But here, we do get examined by our various, uh, various, pro various projects which we write, and we do get assessed, and we do get our grades. This is very vital in leadership. Personal and professional, how do we measure the two? So all leadership or leaders must have, out of the skill sets, I believe, we have, there are two things which are very common in, across the leaders, and this is my realization in the last few weeks, is what are the two common strengths? We talked of a large, large uh, skill sets, but there are two very common things across all leaders, across all leaders. Can you identify them? I will show them the, into you in the next slide. Let me think if you, let me see if you can think about. What are the two, I'm not going to ask the experts, but what do you think are the two common strengths across all leadership? Eloquence. Eloquence? Yes. Not, not off the mark, any other? Confidence. Two common across the boards. Confidence. Confidence, any other? Self-awareness. Self-awareness. The believe in themselves and uh, they respect their Yes. Respecting of the peers. Any other? Presence. Sorry? A Sorry? A vision. A vision? Okay. Any other? Fortitude. Huh? Fortitude. Fortitude. <coughs> quite, off, quite near the mark. Let me share with you what I wrote. What I have seen are two things. You can't do without endurance. And you can't do without communications. <coughs> endurance comes out of an unwritten written stamina. I've not written fitness, because endurance is mind, body, soul. 
Endurance is all the three, which you endure it over a period. You sustain it over a period. You sweat it out over a period, over your lifetime. It's endurance, you endure. And secondly, is communication. You may be having all the possible endurance, but if you can't communicate, you lose your voice. And you're sick, or you can't write. Sometimes it, it, communication is also by word. Today it's technology, but yet there is no substitute or in leadership of communications. I've seen that there are two very important factors. Without this, there is no leadership. Why I say this is that you're all evolving to be leaders in your own way. You're all evolving to be leaders in your own way. Now, which, are, which is the leadership you are going to be following in? I'm going to come to that. But remember that all leadership has to have these two. That means if you qualify for, you work on endurance, and you work on your communications, you are moving towards basic constant, surely towards leadership. After that, you'll fall into a into a into a into a framework of leadership. Like I did. I went into a government leadership. Somebody goes into political leadership. Some sometimes go to, goes into author or writing leadership. But if you don't have these, now why I've written in your is also very this is as another connotation. When it comes to, when it comes to rough and tough, rough and tough, when it comes to physical challenges, women fall out of the race. Why do women fall out of the race? Why? Because they never they we don't play enough games. We don't play. Girls don't play. Girls don't play. Girls don't hit the ball. Girls don't run. Girls don't sweat. Girls don't go to the grind. Some go, but the majority doesn't. Whereas boys play. Boys play. They all out door. So they endure much more. Boys endure. A, they're born biologically stronger. Secondly, they get into endurance and they play much more. And they play a lot of team games. Girls don't play. Which is why when it comes to very critical leadership, you don't see women at the top. You don't see women at the top. Why I why is this? This was an awareness is needed, let me tell you, the last four weeks on leadership. First time in awareness. When I stood up for the elections last, do you know two things were very vital for me? Endurance and communication. If I had not been a sports girl, if I had not had that kind of mental tenacity, I first of all wouldn't have said yes. Secondly, I wouldn't have endured. It was exceedingly good. It was exceedingly challenging. And you, that is why most of the times you don't see majority of the women at the top of these kinds of leadership, particularly leadership which demands endurance. So if the world has to get women as leaders, academic institutions, sir, ladies and gentlemen, have to make sports compulsory for boys and girls. They've got to make girls play. Schools must send girls to play. If you girls don't go to play when they're in school, there's certain leadership almost close to girls. I'm predicting it. This can be tested and researched. So that's my first message of, of this uh, leadership. That if girls are, if you women are looking forward, forward to tough leadership and in tough positions, if you, you haven't played and endured loss, loss and defeat early in school, the leadership, many, many leadership chapters are closed. And I, this can be researched and it can be predicted. And second is communication. She has explained beautifully all aspects of communication. You need a voice. Voice is most critical. Then comes the word, then comes everything else. But if you haven't got the voice, and in this, both Mr. Narendra Modi tops the list. I've seen it. The amount of endurance he has is unbeatable. I've seen this in the last few lectures. The amount of communication skill and the voice and the reach he has, that's why he's won it. He would not have won it. So two, two aspects of that leadership, I think he stands out completely unbeatable at the moment in this country. Now let me show you to the take you to the leadership boxes, my friends. To me, there is no one leadership. There are leaderships and leaderships. And I want you to understand that where you fit in and where do you see yourself going ahead? First 
leadership is academic, and you see the qualities changing in every box. You will see it emerging in the box um, as I show you. In academic leadership, again communication, the teacher has to communicate, and teacher has to be research-based, and has the depth, and of course he has to have the looks. <laughs> the more fluffy the hair, more noble laureate he is, he or she is. So I don't know, that that's the perception. I don't need to say that, but it's, it's, it's just happening. So academic leadership, if you go to, if, you don't, if you're not a communicator, and in the right way, in the right language, and you don't have the depth, over a period you go flat. You go flat, because then you're repeating yourself. You've got nothing new to add. Which means a teacher, academic leadership, it requires, there are many other qualities. I'm not saying I'm denying others. I'm looking at the key ones. If the teacher can't communicate, and has, doesn't have the depth, you cannot rate him as an academic leader. Let's look at corporate leadership. Let's look at the corporate leadership. Look at the qualities here. To my mind, the first thing a corporate leader has to have the strategy. Without this, see, all this is required, but much later. Corporate leadership has to have the strategy and then the vision. The strategy and the vision, and then being authentic, because then he reveals himself, himself, how credible and how authentic he is. So this is my second level, the corporate uh, the box for corporate leadership. Let's look at the third. Civil servant, to which the category I belong to the last 25, seven years. First thing to my mind, civil servant doesn't need communication or research. It needs commitment. Commitment for a civil servant. What has ruined my India or has kept my India weak are two major, the All India Civil Services. By and large, what they lacked was commitment. Commitment to the service they had qualified for. They occupied positions, they became leaders, but they became, they were not commitment. Had there been a commitment, you would not have had any one of the scams which the country suffered. India would have been saved because a commitment would have made them rebel out. You would have had none of those scams which India suffered for the last... It, they, it happened because it was a lack of commitment. They had, they had a, a, a flexible backbone and because it was not committed. It was more committed to post-retirement jobs. What do I get after retirement? So the first thing which is lacking in that's the leadership quality of a civil servant is, so if any one of you is aspiring to be a civil servant, remember, first thing you need to sustain is your commitment. Then sensitivity to people. Because you're not accountable, you're not getting re-elected. You're not getting re-elected. You're not looking for votes all the time. So you have to remain sensitive by nature through commitment. And third is your legal, your professional acumen and the courage to, be, courage to speak up. Let's look at the last one. The fourth, the last part one, because I have a political one is the last. Let's look at the social leadership. Look, the first thing for social work is missionary zeal. You don't, it's not anything else. You need, you may need all this, but the first thing you, if you're a social worker is your missionary zeal. A social worker is social worker not by job, but at ease he or she is best at if, he's, if he or she has got the missionary zeal. The Mother Teresa's of the world. N nobody had to be told, Mother never had to be told to do this. She just did it because her conscience or her heart went out. So first, where you are best at is when you have a missionary zeal. And then compassion. And there's an element of spirituality. Uh, these three qualities go for the, for the social leadership. And the last but not the least, which I've chosen, is political. I pick up ambition first. Don't be a political leader if you do not have that razor edge ambition. I did not have it. I don't have it. I have the commitment. I have the missionary zeal as a person. I don't have this ambition. I fought the election without the ambition. I fought the election with a missionary zeal. Not for the book, not for a ambition. I didn't have it. If I had it, I would have been in politics 20 years ago when I was at the top of the service and there was one, every party coming up to me saying, could you do this? And I said, no, I will serve. Commitment and missionary zeal is my strength. I didn't have it. 
you, don't, you can't borrow it for a temporary period. So friends, if any one of you wishes to go political, ask yourself, do you have the ambition? If you don't have it, then you're not in it. And politics is not mission easy. It comes in later. But first thing is ambition. Why? Because you have to use all kinds of skill sets to score over. And some will be ethical, and some will be not ethical. So I would, that's what I'm trying to compare for you youngsters. I do not know. And second is endurance. See, it comes back here. If you can't endure that ambition, that you're not, then you are not a political leader. You'll fall out very fast. So endurance is critical in their communications. And they're very critical here is networks. Therefore, the deeper you are, the earlier you start politics in life, the better. There are no rights and wrongs in the leadership. I've given you analysis of my years of experience as I saw. I'm not claiming any correctness in this righteousness. I'm only sharing with you a lifelong experience of a book I'm open. So you are only benefiting from what is my recent observation. Endurance is critical, and that's why if you notice the current political leadership in India fits into this on automatically. Has got the ambition, had the ambition right from the very beginning, started very early, got the networks, got deep roots, relationships, friendships, networks, etc. Worked it out together. And their perception is very vital. How is a person perceived over a period? To me, my to my mind, it's very important. Choose whichever. Now, I'm not trying to claim that from social leadership you can't be political. I'm giving you skill sets, leadership skill sets, that base, without these basics you can add, you can reprioritize up to you, but you want to be any one of these leaders, you can switch, but remember that you have to then learn and unlearn or acquire a little more. To my mind, these are leadership boxes I thought I would share with you today. Now, let me go to the next aspect is women. Having grown up in my country where, and in the, into the, in the years, when I remember I had a clear choice. In the 60s when I was being brought up, clearly dowry was not an offense. Dowry was openly displayed at that time. I had a very clear choice, born of rich parents, that I could be married off with huge amount of dowry. But that's not what I grew up for. I grew up with a, uh, with a purpose in life, with a clear purpose that I will have a home. I could become a mother if I choose to. I would have a husband who I could be a friend with, but not somebody who, who decides for me and dominates me. But I would have a purpose in life where I could contribute towards nation building. And nation building was a part of my DNA. When Even when I taught the university in my master's, I had a British Columbia University scholarship waiting for me in Vancouver. I didn't go when my sister had already gone because it was so much in my DNA to stay back and work for my country. So it was all this plus. At that time, what I'm saying, why I'm saying this is that every woman in India will be and has been a product of her education or non-education, poor education or high education. Every woman is a product of this, which basically comes back to decision making by the parents. Secondly is the environment she grows up in. What kind of environment? It's education is opportunities, quality, nurtures. Education also means nurtures. Is environment. So this is quite a lot. The beginning is the gardeners are the parents. What kind of gardeners you get? What kind of nurturers you get? So woman in India is very handicapped by all these three. Poor education or inadequate education or incomplete education or even after the use of education, how much he uses it, how much he's allowed to use or she allows it herself. When she gets married, the patterns change. So education is very critical or use of education or continuing education. Secondly is the environment. What kind of environment she was? Environment in the school, environment in the workplace, environment which comes through media. What kind of environment? Environment which comes through films. What kind of environment is she continuing to relate with? How much is she accepting and how much she is not accepting? How much she is rejecting or saying no to? Third is her own experience. How is she responding to external experience of which is going on? Let's say, look at the insecurity with the Indian woman today. Today, one of the biggest challenges before India is 
In insecure environment, her mobility is very heavily affected in Indian women. Her mobility, her growth, her job, her late evening hours is completely affected by an insecure environment in India. I think that's what happens. Even state-wise, uh, there have been surveys how every state has been compared with um, on levels of insecurity quotient. This state varies very severely from uh, city to city, state to state. And finally, her experience in, with the uh, misogyny or the male-dominated environment. How does she, I've experienced it. You have the courage to reject it. You have the courage to accept it. You have the courage to reform it. But not everybody has that opportunity, my friends. So a woman, if you're looking at, is a clearly product of three E's. Her education, her environment, and her experience. If we have to make women equal, the 500 million plus women grow up equally equal contributor to nation building, then we have to look, to look at the way a girl is nurtured, her educated. And even her continuing education, like a woman's life in India alters completely after marriage. Either she decides or somebody else decides. Even on the time, even on very highly educated women, when is she going to be a mother? What kind of work environment she has? There's a very large dropout of women professionals, highly educated, to readjust by choice, perfectly fine, but by compulsion or by family circumstances, that's a huge loss to the nation of all the all the all the all the investments into education, which all upbringing which went into her. She stays back not by choice. Every woman has a right to her own choice. Let me come back. The last one is the social work. I told you that this is. Today, India is completely into haves and have-nots. I got into social work while in the police service, 26 years ago. While serving, I came across a lot of communities. I came across uh, a work, um, crime, uh, came across clusters and clusters which were breeding crime. And that's where my social work was born, to prevent crime. I noticed that there's a, you are in that situation of a have. You need to identify for yourself. As a have, what, how are you going to use this have? Because there's a very large, particularly Indian, if you're going to come back to India or continue to, continue to connect with India or work with India, there's a very large have not. And this have not today is, has the voting power. It is this have not which has the voting power. And as long as the have not is today going to be the majority voting power, you will be also led by in many situations, majority. The leadership may be different. Leadership may still be have, but the majority of the uh, policies would be to, towards have-nots and not towards have. But the, the India of today should be all about haves. The, why I brought this have to have-not is, you need to relook at what is the higher purpose in your entire education? What is your contribution, um, imagined contribution or likely contribution towards the have-nots towards India. There's just plenty. And uh, Dr. Fennell, she was talking about, and there was a question from you, from Alvar, about, uh, I remember the Alvar. Uh, <laughs> one thing which this country can quickly do to narrow a skill gap and narrow the demand and the supply is any school, any college, which is being run only till morning, till afternoon, should become a polytechnic in the afternoon, and should get linked with companies. There would be a demand and supply. So let that be company led. Schools and colleges and universities. Why should such resources come to shut down at four o'clock? Why can't they be four to 10 o'clock? Why not? Isn't it? It can work twice over. Overnight, India would have double the numbers of polytechnics. If China has 500,000, we have hardly 5,000 polytechnics. How do we make it 500,000 with such a great population when India needs 10 million jobs every year? How? And how do we narrow the skill gap? By creating, creating a, a skills opportunities for the have-nots. There are none. There are none. I don't understand why should a government institution school close at four? Why can't it become an evening polytechnic in the whole neighborhood? And why can't companies who need certain jobs be linked to them saying, you create the, we give you infrastructure, you create the jobs, you bring the skills, and you pay the government something for the infrastructure. 
So they have a bana banaya land. They have a bana banaya building. All they need to bring is expertise and create plumbers, create electricians, create technologists, create accountants, create retail, retail managers, create IT specialists, create designers. They could be designing schools around. Why not? It just needs a policy change. This is something which was being stated uh, in the last few weeks. Why can't we be overnight? So what I'm saying is, innovative thinking is very vital. It's, it's giving that works. When you ask me to say what works, giving works. My two foundations are reaching out to over 10,000 people a day. It has worked for every child. It has worked made every difference. It didn't matter which faith he belonged to, which category of caste he belonged to. Every child today is, is now. By the way, I invite any one of you to join my two foundations as internships at every time. Come and work with me in villages of Haryana. Come and work with me slums in Delhi. Come and work with me with children in prisoners. I have 10,000 people uh, benefiting every day through various projects. Go to my website called Navjyoti and India Vision Foundation. You, any one of you is welcome to do internship with me and work at the grassroots level. You will have data right away. I told Ravi. Where is she? I told her yesterday. And in fact, she suggested, ma'am, do, do announce it. Any one of you is open, just connect with me through my website. KiranBedi.com, there's an email, and I would be very happy to accept any one of you in turn. Once you learn by doing, your whole pattern and your compact, your mission, your feeling for the have-nots will change. You will start being a have to a have-not. And I think that's what India is waiting for. It's waiting for a return of investment of, from your kind to show the kind of social leadership along with your academic, corporate, institutional, government, or political leadership. Thank you very much. You have just spoken. We have also time for time for question and answers. So uh, please go for. First of all, uh, I really appreciate that you were quite open about your political ventures. So, the first thing is that even though you were so resolved about what you knew about yourself and what you were capable of, the first thing is that I want to know why did you say yes in the first place? And among all that. Let me just stop at that and answer. Okay. You come to the second. I said yes because of the trying circumstances, the kind of picture I had of the city, what, where it was going to. I thought I needed to dare. Because I'll not regret later on that supporting I pitched in things would have been different. So I dared myself not to regret later that if I was a spell sitter, maybe the result would have been different. I would have never forgiven myself. Now I have, there's nothing to forget or forgive. It's, it's like having dared and done my bit. Whether, whether it, I made it, made the difference or not, history will judge. But the point is, I dared. I dared in the end and I gave it all my best. That's why by nature I said I haven't failed because I didn't fail because I gave it all my best in the time frame I had. Okay, next question. Uh, you had a second question. Okay, uh, <laughs> yeah. so sorry for that. Uh, um, I just want to say that growing up, you've been like a, a larger than life superhero picture for me and I'm very happy to hear your talk today. And um, I wanted to ask you, and by the way, I was rooting for you in Delhi. And, uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, what do you, where do you see yourself in the political scenario in, say, five or ten years? Do you, what, 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 um, what is Kiran Bedi, the politician, going to do? Now I'm not in a position to say never to never. <laughs> never say never. Because circumstances can alter at that time. If that's your mind and your conscience tells me you got to plunge in then you go by your court. So I would say nothing to, no to nothing. No to nothing. But probably I'll add more knowledge to more decision making. That's my learning. That if it's a, Even if it's a, a decision to be taken soon enough, then I'll add more knowledge. But in this, in this situation, there wasn't even time for more questions. So you take it. You take it. So I would say nothing to know. But all that I've been doing continues. More gets added, God knows. 
Let's, let's leave it to Destulina. Um, using your own framework, what would you say was the fundamental flaw in your campaign? There wasn't a flaw. <laughs> there were flaws. <laughs> Laws in the whole campaign as a whole. No, it was not one-sided. It was campaign as a whole. Like for instance, something which I've written about also: the road shows. The road shows which every political party indulges in. I, as a former cop, just couldn't take it. It was breaking all traffic norms. <laughs> to step in to say no more. <laughs> I too st sitting up on a truck to say sorry. This is happening. I won't let it happen again. But I'm caught at the moment. I won't let it happen again. I would, this is just not one where you will bring a city to a grinding halt and everybody waits for hours for you to go. It's a sin. Yeah. Uh, so firstly I'd like to thank you for your insight on leadership. And uh, my question would be, so your, interest, your journey from uh, being a civil servant into politics has been interesting. So what is the most uh, interesting learning that you've had in the past uh, two years, I'd say? Stay in yours and continue to communicate. <laughs> stay fit, stay fit and continue to be capable of taking on. So stay with stamina, stay with mental tenacity, mind, body, soul working together, which means continue to evolve as a person. So when you evolve as a person, you continue to learn communications because you are continuing to research for yourself, read for yourself, reflect for yourself, communicate for yourself. Continue to grow. God knows where you're going for. You do not know. So stay prepared. Stay preventive. Stay prepared. Yeah, um, good afternoon. And I think I would like to thank you for your wonderful presentation. And a slight shift to the, from politic questions to um, a different question. You said that uh, you were very fortunate enough to uh, make a choice because your parents were also financially stable and uh, you didn't want to get married off without giving a huge sum of money as a dowry and you prefer to go on to education. My question today is that apart from a certain class of society that does not have that opportunity uh, to make their daughter study, there are many affluent, well, uh, you know, people who are very affluent, they are financially more than sufficient. They would rather spend more money on their daughter's wedding rather than the education. Because they're still living in good old times. <laughs> they have money, but the mod money doesn't necessarily mean modernity. So how would we uh, kind of change it? Because I think I've tried to speak to people and people are like, you know what, I just want to get married and I can, as long as I can shop, what else can I do? So how can you know, <laughs> yes, shopping is essential for a girl, no doubt, but I think they're... <laughs> I think there's something beyond the... Uh, let, that, let that be their choice. That too is a great choice. To be married and do nothing else beyond that. It's a great choice. Okay. I think it's a great choice. Enjoy it. But I think it's uh, very essential to make... That's uh, probably different for you and me. We perceive it differently. But if they're happy just being married and living a great social life, it's their choice. Okay, probably. Yeah. It's another way of living. Thank you. It's only when you work living against your choice. That's, that's an injustice. That's unjust. That's injustice. I would say a woman, when she's compelled to change her because of other pressures, that's to me un. If she's in it by choice, I think she's happy. In the end of the day, what, what do we do for? To be happy in whatever we want? To be comfortable in your skin? Uh, it's really uh, an honor to be in the same room as you right now. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, you, one of your points was that uh, the woman today, uh, as you said, the environment is not very secure in India. So, um, like, my question is that what is so, like, um, like in the countries today, like, the rape, the rape rate is pretty high in India. So, what has created such a, what situation, what has created such a situation that, it, like, in the UK, a girl is more safer, but in India, she's still unsafe? What, according to you, has created such a situation or a mindset in the men of India? The man's illiteracy. Illiterate men. <coughs> but then the... Illiterate men in the sense 
We haven't addressed the way men are educated. We haven't addressed, we all work on the girl child. We don't work on the boy's child, boy child. Most of our programs are girl child driven. They're not boys. We don't work on the boy's child, boy. And let me tell you in India, unless the fathers change, Indian society will not change. Fathers have to change. And there is nothing for fathers education. Wherever we girls have made it, we made it because of our fathers. With mothers, fathers. Because fathers' voice is final in the fam Indian family. It's a patriarchal society. Father's fa decision is final. Or a grandfather's decision is final. That's a part of a joint family. I've circulated a book for you all of you, an illustrative story book called Making of the Top Cop. The first two pages is exactly where my father and my grandfather had a fight. Those are the pages, it's a true story, which I've shared with you. Where my grandfather said that, Prakash, my dad said, four do you have four daughters, we got enough property. Why are you sending them to the most expensive school in Amritsar? And you only have a pocket money, you work with, for me. My father used to work for his grandfather's factory, he used to get a pocket allowance. And that's just good enough for them to, my mom and to go for a movie to see, uh, see a movie. There's pocket, tell me all are right. So my grandfather expected us to go to a free school close by. But my father said, no, my children will go to the most expensive and the best school of the city which was far away. And he used to bike us down because my grandfather wouldn't lend his transport to my father for the best school. Unless Indian fathers change, Indian daughters will not grow the way we were. So we, wherever we are today, we are a product of our fathers. And this country is still not working on Indian fathers. Or the new generation who will become a father. So boys' education or men's education is not a focus in my country yet. I, I don't think I can see it during my lifetime. So we need to create that kind of a revolution where we address um, father's education or male education or boy's education. So girls' education, boys' education need two different components until they come to one level. So girls must play games. Girls must play. They, even if you don't have a playground, take them on the road, do jogging. Take them all on the road, go jogging. They've got to get out of their homes and the schools, go road running, go biking. Half the girls wouldn't even know biking in my, in my country. I was trainer in the police. Many women police, when they got recruited, did not know how to bike. And I was supposed to train them up, train scooter driving. How do I train you scooter driving when you don't know how to balance on a bike? And I said, Kaun kya karta tha? Kya tha bhai ke piche baat kya karta So I said, ab toh bhai ko piche badaoge. Chalo, mai sikhaun. So I trained them how to run a bike. The girls joining police service have only written behind the brothers' careers. This is India today. We need to address it. And we need to address father's education. Um, quite informative presentation now. Um, just to follow up on the elections, um, I read somewhere Modi went to Delhi, did a lot of rallies. Did um, Modi? Uh, Prime Minister, uh, Modi ji. <laughs> about this is, Modi asked somebody in Delhi saying, who you went to vote? And this, and this person said, Aapko. <laughs> you get it by the way. Which happened. <laughs> so, I think the question is though, do you think... Uh, because that's a polite word, rather than saying Tumko. <laughs> Maybe I think... You don't say Tumko, you say Aapko. But Aapko is Aapko. Aapko is basically Aapko, yeah. Aapko as well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think the question is maybe, uh, do you think people of Delhi have voted the right party? And uh, is there anything as Delhiites, how many are you going to consider in the future elections as well? Time will tell whether they made the right choice, but the fact is you've got to respect the choice. That's Indian democracy. I think there's a huge gap in Indian bureaucracy over the past few years and you can see that in a lot of different ways in foreign service, in civil service and the police service. So, uh, and the UPSC examinations are not getting reformed anytime soon and neither are you know, qualifications being raised to an extent, there are more people being hired. So how do you think Indian bureaucracy in the future could be reformed to make the state a better structure? Retire those, those who show no commitment. Retire them. 
I think that long security of till you retire, till you become 60, I think it's being taken too much for granted. The average goes up to a very high level. You need to have a system where you do a weeding out of where their lack of commitment or they got involved in, and become hand in glove in all the scams. There is no scam possible by a politician without the support of the bureaucracy. <coughs> you name any, I'm not mentioning any names. Pick up any name. They both have gone to jail together. The politician and the bureaucrat. Gone to jail. And that is what that man was, or person was hired for. Man or a woman. They beat women as well. So it's not been a, corruption has not been a monopoly of only men. So, till that commitment remains. Now, you're not examined for commitment. Commitment reveals itself as you deliver. Sensitivity reveals as you deliver. Right? Communication, your acumen relieves as you deliver. So I think that is not tested. So you need to have a system where you weed out early, five years, 10 years, 15 years. Non-performers go. But that needs a very strong political will because the bureaucracy is a monopoly in this country. If the monopoly wants a particular leader to fail, they will fail. I'm in the politics um, at the University of Warwick, my name is Alden. And you are an inspiration to us all, you are an example to us all. But when a girl can't walk the streets of our capital safely, when she's, you know, when she's afraid for, for her own basic safety, we have failed as a nation. What can we as the young men of India do to ensure that you, our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, feel safe? Tangible action for tangible solutions. I would like you to consider some revolutionary methods of doing it. It cannot be one family at a time anymore. It cannot be just one school at a time. You're talking one point plus billion people. So therefore, I think India needs, if you wanted to see a change in the next two, three years, very massive, revolutionary, grassroots, bottom-up approaches would be needed, and not top-down. Bottom-up approach would be pick up states, pick up few states where it's the women are most vulnerable. I don't want to mention names of the states too, but pick up states. Pick up, and I'm not even saying pick up a village, because it will, it will be just still a drop in the ocean. We've got to pick up states. Let this, let this university adopt a state and saturated work for uh, a women's, uh, women's res respect for women. Saturation. It needs a lot of time investment, resource investment, physical presence, but adopt a state. I think I'm not talking of piecemeal approach anymore, because piecemeal have not worked. And look at the way men look at women. Unless you change the way men look at women, it will not change. Women are already looking at themselves as uh, uh, with confidence. The media is impacting them. But it's not changing the men. Women are changing because of the media. Men are not changing by media. On the contrary, they're more, getting even more entrenched. They're getting the negativity more out of the media than the positivity. They means that good exceptions are everywhere. So I think you need to look at, as a university, as students combined, not look at one school adoption, one village. I think adopt a state. Afternoon, ma'am. I just wanted to say, I don't really have a question. I just have reflections. Um, your answer about, first, let there be choice. Uh, nothing is unjust but sabotaging another person of making a choice. And second, that fathers need to change. The story that you spoke about actually reminded me of my mom, and that's why I took, requested for the mic, because had my mom been here, she just want, uh, would have wanted me to thank you for your foundation of Jyoti, because we actually came in contact uh, due to several reasons, and it actually ended up helping us. So thank you. Jyoti giving works. Any giving works. Look at, in your lives ahead, what is the area you will give. Collectively or individually. But give you must. Don't lead selfish lives. There's a story of a particular person who said, there's a king and a, a philosopher, and the king went to the philosopher and said, give me a few words what human life is about. Give me simple words which a man would understand. What is human life all about? The philosopher told the king, give me one week. I'll come back to you after one week. The philosopher came back to the king after one week. And he said, uh, King, he said, quickly give me the answer. He said, very simple. Man is born. He grows up to be a man. He brings up, gives birth to babies. Lives his life married. 
and finally eats and dies. That's it. His point message was, is that the way we're going to live our lives? We will we'll all grow up, we've educated ourselves in best universities, invested best of resources, we look for the best of the career, and then we look for the best of the partner in our lives. We have a lovely home, we have a transport, we got a name. Is that it? That, is that the way we will live? Is this higher education for that, or is it a higher purpose? This will all be falling in place anyway. It will, you've earned it, you'll get it. But what plus? Where is that plus purpose? Because even animals grow up, get babies and they die, they, and they finish, life goes on. But is a human purpose, human life for this only, or is it plus? I would say, add plus. What is that plus in your life which you would like to add? Identify that individually and collectively. The daily haves have that plus. The have-nots will not be have-nots anymore. The world will become haves in the coming decades. But if the haves continue to shell themselves into this, into growing up, babies, home, career, and then finally dying, then there will be constant conflict in this world between haves and have-nots, and have-nots will govern when we decide and lay down the policies, and the haves will have to submit to those, to those policies. Remember, whether they're right or wrong, I'm not being judgmental. Have-nots could have right policies too. But then don't crib. But if you want to be haves and a collective living, then grow up, but have a higher purpose where you contribute for a, a contribute through your life and through your living. Thank you very much.